For part two of chapter nine lecture, we'll talk about um, upper atmosphere winds, or as they're called, winds aloft. And these are winds that are in the upper atmosphere. And we start by looking at the intertropical convergence zone, which you remember is the area, uh, the band around the equator, which migrates north and south depending on season, where we have convergence. So we have winds blowing in, and because they pile up here, they rise up. We have low pressure around the equator and stormy conditions because of all the moist, uprising air that can produce um, very strong thunderstorms. So when we continue the circulation pattern that you see in the red here, there's convergence at the surface, uplift, and then the air spreads out. We have divergence aloft. And so we have these uh, convective cells here. And remember, this is the Hadley cell circulation. So we have uh, this transport of this warm equatorial air that drifts in the upper atmosphere poleward in the northern and southern hemisphere. And then it starts to sink or subside around 30 degrees north and south latitude. And the other circulation that we saw begins to kick in. When we look at middle latitudes, so away from the equator and away from the pole, in between there, we have winds that are blowing from the west to the east in a wave-like pattern of ridges and troughs that defines what we'll see is the jet stream. So when we look at what's happening here, there's a, this is where the, um, the polar lows meet the subtropical high and this strong difference between cold polar air and warm tropical air causes very strong pressure gradients and uh, this flow pattern that is responsible for moving a lot of the weather through the middle latitudes. So when we have this clash of, of different air masses, we have the formula we need for weather. And so we have, uh, again, this poleward transport of warm air and some of this cold air making its way uh, back down south in the northern hemisphere. If we take a look at surface ocean currents, we have uh, a similar pattern in the ocean currents as we have from surface winds. At the surface, the ocean's currents are driven by the wind. So we have a large-scale movement of ocean water that mimics the large-scale atmospheric circulation. And these large circulations in the ocean are called gyres or gyres. These are uh, big circulation regimes that we can see when we look at a map of world ocean currents. So let's take a look at one of these maps, and we see here in the Pacific Ocean off the west coast of the United States and extending over to Asia, we have a big gyre here that is transferring air uh, in the atmosphere. The atmospheric circulation around this subtropical high um, is mimicked in the ocean currents that we see here. And you'll see as you look through here, the same types of patterns occur in the ocean currents as we saw in part one occur for the larger scale atmospheric circulation. You may have heard in the news um, this past year about a trash island or a trash vortex. And this is uh, garbage that gets dumped into oceans and ends up getting caught in these gyres. And so it just kind of spins around, you know, it circulates around the ocean. And as it does, it breaks up a little bit. Plastics break up, uh, but they don't really disintegrate in the sense of they just vanish. They break into tiny little particles that um, introduce toxins and dangerous uh, things that fish in the ocean can eat. So here's a YouTube website, or sorry, a Greenpeace website that we can visit. So here's a Greenpeace website that you can visit that explains more about this issue if you're interested. 
So if we look at uh, waves in the westerlies, we have this um, upper air current that I talked about a moment ago. And when it's behaving itself, let's say, we have what's called zonal flow. So something like you see up here where the, the winds are blowing um, kind of parallel to the, the lines of latitude. And this is called zonal flow. And then in a more um, extreme situation, when we have uh, winter, for example, in the northern hemisphere, where we can have this cold air drop way down, and then the, the warmer air kind of wedge its way in between, we get what's called meridional flow. And meridional flow is almost vertical, right? It's almost flowing parallel to the lines of uh, meridians, the lines of longitude. That's where it gets its name from. And so this is something that happens with uh, this dance we have between the polar low and the subtropical high with this cold air and this warm air. It just, it, it's always erratic. So sometimes it's flowing this way, sometimes it takes a dip, and we have these troughs and ridges that really cause a lot of weather to happen for us in North America. So it makes it really challenging for long range forecasting because it's really hard to forecast what this is going to do. So here's an example of something that can happen. We get what are called blocking systems and uh, we've seen this in North America and this happens when um, we get strong meridional flow in the in the uh, jet stream area here in the westerlies and it, it's so strong that we can have this little breakaway system so this little pocket of cold air kind of breaks away from the main flow of this polar low and then we get this warm f air that gets stuck in a circulation pattern in between there so instead of having a constant kind of flow we get these little subsystems that are created and they kind of block the usual flow of air and we see uh, some examples here where we've had extreme weather events because of this kind of weather dynamic in the top picture in A this is from 1988 which some of you may remember some of you may not there was a severe drought and the drought was caused in part, it was in the summer, it was caused in part because of this breakaway uh, pattern that we had with this high pressure cell, with this high pressure cell here, and it just kind of camped out over the central part of the United States. And high pressure, remember, causes stable air. We have sinking air, so there's not really any chance for thunderstorm development and uh, very, very little chance of rain. So things dry out. And that's what happened. So a uh, very severe drought that took place at that time. Another example, um, well, before we jump into that, this picture down below shows a more average circulation pattern. So you can compare what was going on in the summer of 1988 to what's more average. And you see, yeah, there's high pressure, but we don't have like an individual high pressure cell just camped out over the United States. We have this flow of uh, winds in motion. Here's another example of one of these blocking systems that happened in 1993, again in the summertime for us in, the, in North America, in the Northern Hemisphere. Here we had um, a, a high pressure system that was camped out kind of over the, the southeastern portion of the United States and the jet stream uh, was kind of dipping down a little bit so we had this play between these two contrasting air masses and the circulation around this high is of course clockwise so the winds that were coming up to the middle where this green arrow is were warm moist winds or warm moist air that swooped up on the on the western side of this high pressure system and met this area where the jet stream is and caused a lot of precipitation so there was uh, severe flooding record flooding in the midwest and um, drought again over the southeast because it's more in the heart of the high pressure cell where there's not going to be any chance of precipitation. So the jet streams are very fast moving air currents that are like long long rivers. Because they're so high up in the atmosphere they are not bound by friction of the surface so they can flow very fast. The speeds get up to over 200 miles per hour in the northern hemisphere our primary jet stream is what we call the polar jet like we saw in the previous slides 
Um, it's the boundary between the subtropical high and the polar lows. It forms at the tropopause between the troposphere and the stratosphere and right at that boundary where the cold polar air meets the warmer subtropical air and it's these differences in pressure and temperature that cause severe pressure gradients and allows the jet stream to really be created at all for that fast moving air in response to these steep pressure gradients. Here's a picture of the jet stream. You can see it kind of sits right around that boundary between the subtropical high and the polar lows and it's responsible for driving the weather in our country, in, in the United States. Here's kind of a, a cross section as we look um, from the North Pole over here on the x-axis on the far left and we make our way south to the equator and what we're really looking at here is the, the position of the jet stream and here's the height of the tropopause. So the troposphere is much thicker where it's warmer. So if we were to measure the depth of the troposphere at the equator, it's much deeper than it is at the North Pole and we see this uh, continuous decrease as we move poleward. Where these big J's are represent the jet streams. So right at about um, 30 degrees north latitude we have the subtropical jet and then the polar jet that I just mentioned is uh, right around 60 degrees where the cold polar air meets the warm subtropical air. The subtropical jet is responsible for uh, some of our weather more uh, in the southeastern part of the state uh, but it's not as strong, it's not as sharply defined as the polar jet. So the jet streams are uh, definitely, uh, they vary with seasons. So in the winter both of the jet streams become much stronger and here we're seeing um, the polar jet. So in the summer it's pretty far north, right? It's retreated because it's northern hemisphere summer things are warm so all that cold air has retreated further north. In northern hemisphere winter when the when the cold air comes back down that jet stream can be as low as you see it in this blue line here. Typically you know it's kinda like right in the middle here but we can get these big dips that dip way down. The subtropical jet stream is found just on the pole side of the Hadley cell, that first circulation cell from the intertropical convergence zone and where it begins to subside around 30 degrees north and south uh, latitudes. So uh, as we saw on the previous slide there's the break in the tropopause there and it allows for um, this jet stream. It also is stronger in winter and it's less variable with latitude than the polar jet stream is. It, it doesn't have those erratic rises and sinks troughs and ridges like we see with the jet stream. Okay, that's the end of part two.